can't live without social media. Oh my God, I feel so nervous. My palms are sweating and my heart is beating so fast. I feel like it's about to fall on the floor, exposed for you all to see. All the while I'm thinking, say the right thing, the right move, the right amount of self-sacrifice. Oh, really this all feels just like the anxiety of a first date. Man, I wonder what my Tinder profile might say about me. Oh, well, I'm Dylan. I'm actually 30 years old, and I am less than a kilometer away from you. <laughs> I'm a social worker meets media maker, and I'm also a violence against women advocate, currently working at the Ottawa Coalition to End Violence Against Women, we're a tiny yet mighty organization here in Ottawa. Recently, I was appointed to the Minister of Status of Women's Advisory Committee to help shape the federal strategy to end gender-based violence in Canada as the LGBTQ expert and cyber violence expert. But mostly, my Tinder profile might tell you that I'm awkward. My best pickup line is, do you want to play Scrabble? <laughs> it might tell you that I'm gender non-conforming, which means I use the pronouns they and them that I like long walks on the beach, that I have three Tamagotchi children, <laughs> and that my life is an excruciating and torturous push and pull between my feminist identity and my undying love for The Bachelor. <laughs> I know, I know, there really is no hope for me. But I guess in a way, our lives are all one swipe right away from something. And that something isn't always a perfect match or happily ever after. Sometimes we can't always see what's in the depths of people's lives in the glow of our iPhone screens or on our Tinder profiles. You know, I have a hard time telling my story. I was 20 then, and I'm 30 now. And some things don't necessarily change, but I know that I have. You see, late one night, I was walking to my car after class in my first year of university. And my car was located in one of the furthest lots. And there I was raped by three men. <sighs> there, I said it. It doesn't get any easier, but I think you get stronger. I cannot begin to express to you the enormity of that night. As survivors, I think we spend a lot of our time running, running from something or trying to find somewhere desperately to run from. And you run from it for as long as you can until you finally have to face it. And facing it is through no choice or no fault of your own, but sometimes it's impaled upon you. And you have to carry it with you wherever you go, along every crack and crevice, along every edge and cliff. You always contemplate the jump, but you don't want to fall off. I couldn't get out of bed for weeks. My body hurt all of the time. Sometimes I had to shower six times a day just to scrape them off me, like salvation. I quit school. I lost a scholarship. My parents couldn't figure out what was happening to me, how I could go from being an honor roll student to just never going back to school. The thing that I didn't know would be the hardest was the amount of friends I didn't know I would lose. I still feel like I lost parts of myself that night, parts that I'm not sure you ever get back. So you try to pick up the pieces over and over again. You try to gather up enough courage to go on. Why would anyone want to rape someone who looks like you? 
Every day reminds me of that day in some small irrelevant way, whether it's I see a car that reminds me of that night, or I wear perfume or smell perfume that reminds me of that night. These are my daily reminders. But don't worry, I'm not just a survivor. I'm not just broken, I'm not tragic. I'm surviving. I'm here and I'm amazingly alive. And I might be one in three, but I know that these statistics are actually people's lives. They're real life experiences and they're trying to tell us something. Sexual violence doesn't just happen at night. It doesn't just happen when strangers decide that they want to attack or harass women. It happens in our communities and our families. It happens with our friends. It happens at our schools. It happens on the internet. It happens when we live in a society built on racism and colonialism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism. It happens when we live in a culture that blames survivors for their actions and doesn't hold people who hurt others accountable. It happens when we live in a society where of the sexual assaults that are reported, so many of them are ever recorded as a crime and even less of those are prosecuted. Sexual violence is all around us. This issue is so much bigger than you or me. So I came to this work not by a coincidence and not by cliche, but because so many of us have our daily reminders. This is Ritea. Ritea grew up in Halifax. She was like a lot of other young people and young teenagers. Her father once told me that she was the kind of person who was willing to help anyone or any animal. She was tender-hearted and fun-loving. And then, in just three short days, her whole life changed. In November of 2011, at the age of 15, Ritea Parsons went with a friend to a party, like most teenagers do, and they were drinking. And there, she was raped by four teenage boys. Ritea couldn't remember a lot of what happened that night, except for the fact that at one point she woke up vomiting while someone was sexually assaulting her. But what she didn't know was that a photograph was taken of the incident, and that photograph became widespread within the school and town in three days. She was blamed, she was slept shamed In the town, nobody would help her in her community. The school would not intervene. The police, when they finally decided to get involved, they, they saw that there wasn't enough credible evidence to be able to lay a charge. He said, she said. In three whole days, her whole life changed. On April 7th, at 11.15 p.m., Retea Parsons died by suicide. She died struggling to live like she had spent the last 18 months of her life. Her case was reopened in light of new, credible information, and there is a charge of distribution and production of child pornography. But in a lot of ways, there really was no justice for Retea Parsons, because we're still not talking about what happened to her, that she was sexually assaulted, or that she experienced online gender-based violence. And at the end of the day, she's still gone. How are we all doing? I know, that's tough. Just remember that we're all in this together, and take a moment to breathe, and we can hold each other up. But this begs a bigger question. Is the internet a wild, wild west that can't be tamed? The problem of violence and abuse is the greatest challenge the internet faces today. In a recent report with the UN, over 73% of women reported experiencing some form of online gender-based violence. What we know about gender-based violence locally is that in a research study over with young women in high schools, 100% of the respondents said that they're, they, have, they have experienced gender-based violence. But the thing is, is that technology is always changing and we can't keep up. I know. 
A lot of us, the internet is kind of just like this weird experience that we have, but for a lot of young people, it's a place where they find community and empowerment, but it's also quite dangerous. From what we know in talking with young women and looking at the issues, is that this is so much bigger than just mean tweets or comments on articles. There's the issue of online harassment, which, I mean, we talk about trolls, and I'm not talking about the cute trolls with the hair and the, the jewelry. I'm talking about people who are on the internet harming people, and oftentimes this harm is aimed at women. I have a friend who's a feminist blogger in Toronto, and just because she uses a platform to talk about experiences and what it's like to be a woman, she's had people seek out her private information and release it publicly, where her child goes to school, where she works, her banking information. This is what's happening to women just for the sake of having a voice online. The issue of non-consensual distribution of intimate images, also we sometimes talk, to it, talk about it as revenge porn or sexting. Well, it's not porn because it's not consensual. And it's not revenge because we shouldn't feel entitled to those things to begin with. But we saw this with the case of Jennifer Lawrence in her, her iCloud leak with all of her intimate images. We saw this with Amanda Todd, who was a young person in BC, who had her photos go viral, and she was slut-shamed, and she had to change schools at least three times before she committed suicide. We see this in the issues of recordings of sexual assaults, like with what happened to Retea Parsons and so many other young women on the internet. There's a recent Netflix documentary about Audrey and Daisy and what it means to be a victim online and how victims are demonized and perpetrators aren't held accountable. Digital dating abuse. I can go on the Google app store and find things like a girlfriend tracker. I can go on Tinder and use GPS location and geomapping just to figure out where people are. These are things that happen on the internet. People talk about Black Mirror as being this kind of technological future, but we're actually living that right now. I know, right? <laughs> it's terrifying, but don't worry. I have some hope for you. There's young people in Canada, in Ottawa, who are doing such amazing work around these issues, and there's some things that they want you to know. For example, cyberbullying, please stop using that term. It's overused, it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't actually get at what we're talking about. This is violence. This is also a gendered issue. It affects mostly young women, and LGBTQ people, young people of color. It's relentless and inescapable oftentimes because you can't escape it even if you go home at night. It's a systemic issue. But also that adults focus too much on the negative sides of online life. You have to talk telling young people to get off the internet, because this is where their communities are. This is where they find their friendships and support. And it's not consent if you can't understand. These long terms and conditions, community policies that people can't understand, legal jargon, young people, they say, hey, if we can't understand it, then we don't consent to it. It's like being on a powder keg that's about to explode. And surveillance, it's actually a problem, it's not a solution. We should stop policing young people. And we should help them because they are the experts of their own lives. But if you put all these things together, it really is a perfect storm. How many of you have made a mistake when you were a teenager? Most of us. Imagine never being able to escape that mistake. Imagine never being able to have the right to be forgotten. Do you really want to live in that world? Young women in Ottawa are change makers, but we need a paradigm shift because this is not just a women's issue, it's everybody's issue. We need to be building communities of care, community that requires critical awareness of all the things we must continue to do and build on and work to unlearn all the ways in which we engage and behave that actually sustain gender-based violence. We need a culture change. We need for young people to be able to come up to us and say, hey, I'm in it really deep right now. I'm in a mess, I'm in trouble, and I could really use your help, mom and dad. They need to be able to go to trusted adults for support. 
They need you to listen. They need you to stop blaming them and shaming them and telling them, don't share your pictures, don't text. We need to have these conversations with young people. We need to tell them that they're not alone. And there's other things that we need to think about too. We need to start asking ourselves hard questions like, for people that are developing these technologies, are we developing them with young people in mind and with women in mind? Where is your corporate social responsibility when you're creating these kinds of platforms? The issue, for example, of free speech. Free speech for whom? We need to work together to do this, whether you're a parent or an educator or an advocate or you're a person working in the technology sector. Because building safer digital spaces means the ability for all users of all genders, sexualities, races, abilities to be able to come and participate meaningfully in these online spaces. Because not everything is a disaster. And even when it is, we'll be able to know what to do with it. And I'm talking about real power, not just empowerment. And if I could leave you with just one thing today, it's this. If a person in your life comes to you and they trust you enough to tell you the hardest thing that's ever happened to them, believe them. In doing this, you have the power to help remake the world in the next 150 years. Thank you.